we ended reading the scriptures for Revelation chapter 18, so I'm briefly going to talk about what happened in Revelation 18, and then we're going to move straight to Revelation 19. So let's go there together. Revelation 18 continues the completion of what's called the seventh vial of destruction of the capital city of the Antichrist, which is named Babylon. This will be a huge commercial center of commerce where the Antichrist will be the ruler of the world and rule from there. It will be known by international travelers of all kind and merchants, making it a very, very rich city as well, of thir- as well as 30 specific articles of commerce that are mentioned in chapter 18 that will be affected. Anybody, or, or here, here's the way you probably heard it, the supply chain will be broken when Babylon is destroyed. We see in what happens in chapter 18, death, mourning, famine, and the city is utterly burned with fire. Now we're moving to Revelations 19. And I saw these things. Did I put that in there? That's okay. You're doing great. You're doing a great job about it. No one knows how difficult the sound room is until something goes wrong and then everybody in the church looks at you, but nobody wants to go back there and learn how to do it. I need to quit meddling. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God because His judgments are true and righteous. For He has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality and his, he, he has avenged the blood of His bondservants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sit on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. If you've been sticking with us, the Antichrist rode a white horse, but this is not the Antichrist. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. That's that's a synonym for crowns. And he has a name written on him, which no no one knows except him. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. For his mouth cometh a sharp to it, uh, comes a sharp sword, so that it with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which come which fly in the mid-heavens. Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sit on them and all the flesh of men, both free and slave and small and great. 
Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence. Let me reinforce and remind you, just because it seems miraculous does not mean God is doing it. Who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive in the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, forgive me for getting ahead of myself. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Father, for your blessings that are new every morning. We thank you, God, that you're going to lead us, Father, to learn something today. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation 19, like many of the books of Revelation, covers a lot of stuff in 21 verses. One of the first things it describes is a marriage and the marriage supper of what's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Christ many times compares his relationship to the church. The strongest relationship he could compare is that which is between, say, husband and a wife. That the church is his bride. So no matter whether you're a big boy, a little boy, a tall boy, a thick boy, a big girl, a little girl, if you are a Christian, you are part of a bride that is being prepared and is preparing yourself for the groom. And there will be a supper called the marriage supper of the Lamb where everyone who makes it, who are a part of the heavenly host, will sit down with, and, and I don't know if there will be literal food there. I cannot tell you how much I don't care for there to be literal food. I'll just be glad I'm in heaven. The joke is you wonder if they'll have deviled eggs at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I don't care. Some of y'all catch that later. The marriage supper of the Lamb will happen and we will sit with all the saints that have gone before us. And th after that it transitions from the marriage supper of the Lamb just before Christ returns to the earth again. The bride of Christ will celebrate with all the saints throughout. And all of history represents the bride of Christ. Let me tell you something. The reason, I'm, I, it's going to sound like a rabbit, but it's not. Okay, I promise. Crisscross applesauce. One of the many reasons we eat together on Wednesday nights, there's several reasons. One of them is it's hard to get your family to church on a Wednesday night. It just really is. When we, and then when you get your family to church on a Wednesday night, if you have a free hot meal, well, Ken, I don't like the chicken nuggets. Well, that's okay. They're salad. Find something, you know. Okay. But I wish we had all round tables so we could all look at each other. But we sit at tables. And, and what's the rule around here at Goshen? No one sits alone. Now, I got a few rebels. I ain't going to call their names. But on Wednesday night meal... At least I know you don't sit alone. Why? Because you get intimate with who you eat with. That's why the verse that says, I will prepare a table in the presence of your enemies is so powerful. That when you are living like you're supposed to live and doing what you're supposed to do, the Lord will prepare a table for you in the very presence of your enemies. And when we are together at a table, it makes a difference. When we are together at a table, it makes a difference. At the marriage supper of the Lamb, I don't think that it's a coincidence that we're going to be sitting at a table with other believers. And the, the, the question, I think it was, I don't know, somebody smart, some very smart man or woman of God said, one day you're going to sit across the table from another Christian. Imagine you're sitting across the table from a little girl dressed in what you would probably call rags. She has olive complexion, beautiful brown eyes, and dark black hair. And she says to you, when did you live? You said 2023. Well, what was it like? We had more, we threw away so much food the fields are full of food that we plow in because it's not pretty enough to sell. We have temperature-controlled buildings. 
We have indoor plumbing. You're going to love that. We have, we can, for the first time in human, for, I don't know if y'all know this, but like starting somewhere in the 1950s, 1960s, that's the first time in human history people said what they would and would not eat. For the first time ever, you can leave here and go eat something weird every day because you just want it. Not because, how many of y'all grew up, when, when you did travel, there was no Hardee's and, and McDonald's and, and uh, Ruby Tuesday and Cracker Barrel to stop at. You had a cooler in the back of the car that mom and them put um, some sandwich meat and a loaf of bread and some mustard and mayonnaise, and there used to be picnic table side of the road. Eventually, they put picnic table side of the road, and you could stop if you found one and pull over side of the road. Anybody been there? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay. There was no, there was no stopping and running through the Chick-fil-A, getting the Lord's chicken and stuff like that. You, you had to just, for the first time in history, so you look across the table at that girl and basically tell her you're spoiled. And, of course, the appropriate thing to do is say, how did you come to be here? And she says, well, I'm from somewhere around 50 A.D. And um, my family were Christians, but um, we were taken to the Colosseum. And um, they told my dad and my mom all they had to do was denounce Jesus as Lord and call Caesar Lord and they'd let us go and um, the last thing I remember was them telling my parents well if you refuse to call Caesar Lord then we're going to let the animals eat your children alive in front of you and then we're going to kill you and that's the little girl you sit across the table from are you going to be a little embarrassed I am. I'm going to be a little embarrassed because there's a good chance we're going to be running. You don't know their names. They don't have a status. They don't go down in the hall in the books written down as great men and women of God, but we're going to be sitting across the table and elbow to elbow with giants of faith. And Christians can't even show up. if It takes 90 gallons of baptism and nine drops to keep them out of church. Are we living a life of Christendom? Is our paradigm that which we will be glad we lived it out the way we did? Just something to consider because we're going to be sitting across the table from those people one day. Then the chapter shifts into the battle with Christ, which is called Armageddon, riding a white horse where all of this will take place. The Antichrist and the false prophet who inhabit mortal bodies of men will be killed at Armageddon, but they will be cast into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever, thus leading us to Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1, we start here. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key of the abyss and had a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him to the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. And all these things must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus. And because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image. And had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were complete. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. 
and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came upon the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Then the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of the fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and upon him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell, or Hades, gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and hell were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown in the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, things are starting to wind up now. Things are starting to speed up. Things are starting to get faster and faster. Satan is finally driven from the earth where he will be bound for a thousand years by an angel in a bottomless pit, but then he will be set free for a short amount of time. Since it has been, given, since it has been a thousand years, people will be given a chance to rebel against God that are living under God's rule and Satan will be allowed to recruit anyone who does not want to be with him. But they will be cast with the devil into the lake of fire. In Revelation 20, it continues to go on and tells us that there is a great white throne judgment. And you will be judged for your deeds if you're not a believer. And I be there's, See, there's two different judgments in heaven. I don't know if I covered that. There'll be two different judgments in heaven. The great white throne judgment and then the judgment of Christians who what you do will be judged by fire and everything that's, that's vanity or uh, I think the Bible calls it wood, hay, stubble, stuff that's not worth having. The only thing that's left will be precious things that you did in his name. So we will be judged. It'll be two different things. The great white throne judgment will be for those who did not do what they were supposed to do and I would like to suggest as believers it's important that we do what we are supposed to do now I want to jump very quickly to Revelations chapter 22 Revelations chapter 22 whether people talk about it or not heaven is not just fat babies floating around on clouds heaven is not uh, people playing harps and there's a lot of chatter about, about heaven that it's going to be boring. I don't think heaven's going to be boring at all. I think heaven's going to be perfect, and a new heaven and a new earth are going to come down, and it's going to be the way it was before Adam and Eve lost the title deed to the nations. What are we going to do for all eternity? I want to talk about heaven. Revelation 21, the last books in the Bible. Revelation 21 says, Then I saw... Uh, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Do you have that? Yes, thank you. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. So, so watch this. You're going to go to heaven if you're living right and you're serving him. But at the end of the book, heaven's coming back down to this planet. That's not, is that not what uh, verse 2 said? Go back to two, because some people are looking at me like I was playing on my phone. I didn't catch that. Go back to two. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Three. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among, among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. And he will wipe. Every tear from their eyes. No more crying at night. No more struggling with anxiety and depression and pain 
and hurt and rejection and death. For there will be no more death and there will be no more mourning and there will be no more crying and there will be no more pain. The first things have all passed away. And he who sits upon the throne says, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write these words, for they are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly, the unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and immoral persons, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and Christians don't like this one, and all liars. You know what that word all means in Greek? Picking up what I'm putting down. All liars. Do you lie? But be careful before you answer that. Because if you say no, then you got trouble lying. You better repent. Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke to me saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high and high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down again out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, her brilliance was like a very costly stone and a stone of crystal clear, crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and all the gates, 12 angels, and the names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city is laid out as a square and its length as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its walls 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stone of the city wall was adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third, sh that, that thing right there, the fourth emerald, the fifth, that stone, the sixth sardis, the seventh, that stone, the eighth barrel, the ninth topaz, the tenth, that stone, the eleventh, that stone, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Mm, keep going. Then I saw no temple there. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God has illuminated it. And its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring glory to it. In the daytime, for there will be no night, its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying. Woo! There's that lying again. Shall ever come into it but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So I'm continuing. I'm going to finish with 22, okay? Then he showed me a river of water, and then I'm going to explain it, of life, clear as crystal coming from the throne of God of the Lamb. In the middle of the street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life. You remember it all started in a garden, 
and we got kicked out because of the tree of life. Because God loved us enough to not let our father and mother, Adam and Eve, eat from the tree of life after we fell into sin. But now, on either side of the river was the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There would no longer be any curse. And the throne of the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. So Christians are marked too. And there will be no longer any light, for they will not need a light, not need a, whew, not have a need of the light of a lamp. Thank you. Nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illuminate, illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the Spirit of the prophet, sent his angel to show them his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of the book, worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy, and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside of the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves as that lying again and practices lying. That's Revelations 21 and 22. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, but it will be heavenly and most importantly, no longer subject to the curse of sin. It will be like the Garden of Eden all over again, except the whole planet will be like the Garden of Eden. We know that the Garden of Eden did not extend to the whole planet <clears throat> because of the geographical markers we are given in the Old Testament. But there will be finally paradise, and but most importantly, without the curse of sin. Some of you are old enough to remember when we didn't have to lock our doors. We didn't have to worry about sleeping with the windows open. It's going to be better than that. It will be paradise uninterrupted without sin. And I love this. Sickness, disease, death, thorns, and thistles will no longer be there. So whatever you love on earth, your favorite moments will compel in comparison to what heaven will be like. Now, I understand you enjoy certain places on this earth. They are your place. You love those places. If you have a moment, if you have a nickel, you're going to spend money and you're going to be there. But the, I love the mountains, but the mountains are not heaven. Some people love the beach. The beach is not heaven. Some people love um, these, far, Greenland has these beautiful places in Iceland. There's these places that have these awesome, tremendous places to visit. None of those are heaven. For there will be nothing like heaven. Heaven will be exponentially more beautiful and better than any of your greatest memories or favorite, favorite places on earth. Nothing can compare what the new heaven and the new earth will look like. For those who make it, 1 Corinthians 2 and 9 says, For I saw, excuse me, just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ears have not heard and which has not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Paul said you can't even imagine it. 
That's how awesome it is. Not only will it be beautiful, but most importantly, Revelation 4. Let's go back there very quickly. Revelation chapter 4 says this. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eye, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. We no longer have to rely on the Holy Spirit to bring us comfort. The Bible says that God himself will wipe the tears from our eyes. No more death. No more disease, no more pain, no more crying, no more hurt. No more medicines that make you feel bad, but you feel worse without them. No more suffering ever again. No more migraines, no more cancer, no more diabetes, no more high blood pressure, no more age, no more famine, no more arthritis, no more Alzheimer's, no more wars, no more diverse divorces, no more murders, no more abortions, no more sex trafficking. It's all gone. No more sick babies. No more loved ones that we feel were taken from us too soon. We will be with God in a perfect place forever. As of right now in my mortal body, I cannot see God or experience God fully. But when we get our new bodies at the rapture, we will be able to experience him in his full glory and splendor and look upon his face and God will say, it is finished. He will say his children are with him and he is with his children. Let me give you a simple illustration. Many of you know that Emma's still in college and she's married paying her own bills, and she's adulting. She likes to call me and complain. That's her thing. That's our thing. She'll call me and say, Papa, can I complain? And I'll say, please do. Because the truth of the matter here is every parent just wants their child to call them. But I don't want to be that guy that says, you never call me. So when she calls, she'll say, Papa, do you mind if I complain? And the truth is I just love to hear her voice. I'll tell you all a funny complaining story in a minute. Emma's a senior. Most of you know Sarah Beth's been gone a while. And she's in college, and she's paying her own bills, and she's adulting too. Oh, how they love, even though I taught them, you have to pay taxes and registration on your car every year when that bill came after they moved out. Hallelujah. As a boy, I used to wonder why my mama wanted me to call her all the time and come see her after I left home. Now it tickles me so good when my kids call to just say, hey, to complain about their day or ask a question. I've drilled it into my children. Before you Google it, call me. I don't know more than Google, but Google may have an ad for something that's trying to sell you something. Don't say the mechanic said. I'll say, have you talked to Mr. Jeremy? Have you talked to me? Because <laughs> I'll talk to Mr. Jeremy. Call me. Call me. I'll even, if you have a smartphone, I don't, know if you, I don't know if you know you can do this, I'll text my kids and say, send me a voice memo. It's like a recording of their voice. Send me a voice memo of your voice saying something silly. I just want to hear your voice today. Because I want them to reach out to me, and I want them to feel comfortable about life circumstantial uncertainties, and I want them to call me anytime they want to call me. And if you've been with me any amount of time around me, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but I don't care what I am doing. If my dad, my wife, or my children call me, I'm going to answer the phone. I will excuse myself, make sure my people are okay, and call them back. But I'm, it's not going to voicemail. That I love those people. But... It's coming up time. They're going to ask me, Papa, what do you want for your birthday? Papa, what do you want for Christmas? And I want to say, nothing you can afford. Um, <laughs> but the truth of the matter, I mean, let's be honest. All of us are spoiled, right? We don't have to wait for socks anymore and underwear. We can just go buy them. We don't have to wait till Christmas time anymore. 
So the ticket price has gotten so big, I've gotten to the point that when my children ask me, what do you want for Christmas? I tell them, I don't want a present. I want presents. I want your presents. I want to take, this is my Christmas gift. I want a new family photo. I want us all somewhere with our, some good rags on, and I want to take a family photo. And I want to be in the middle so none of y'all can crop me out and say that picture looks better without you. Like I would do you. Because what's good for the goose? Right? I want to take a family picture. I want them with me as, and home or around me as much as possible. I don't even care. and I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't even care care if, if they sit beside me and we play on our telephones together and just bump our elbows every now and then. Or I, I lean over and bump my head against their head. I want their presence I want them there. I want to be able to say, let's go to Dollar Tree. I need this and such and the other. Ride with me, ride with me, ride with me. I like their presence. And if you're a parent, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. It does your heart good to have your family together all under one roof again, especially as you get older. Now just imagine how good it's going to feel for God to finally have all his youngins back home. One of the scary facts about eternity is that majority of people believe that heaven is a default destination for good people when the truth of the matter is hell is actually our default destination if we don't get right with God. Very few people will believe when asked if they die, they'll go to heaven or hell. Very few people say hell. I think when I did that sermon series, when some of y'all's favorite series when I had the coffin up here, um, what happens when you wake up dead? I think it was 85% of people believe when they die they're going to heaven and only about 7% believe when they die they're going to hell. But only about 50% to be professed to be Christians and only about 20% of Americans attend church regularly. So this isn't good English, but the math is not mathing. Let me carry the one. No, something's not right. The Bible says very few people believe they're going to go to hell. People, well-intentioned people will say at a funeral, oh, he sure does look good. No, he's dead. He wasn't much of a church goer, but he was a good old boy, and I'm sure he's in a better place not right now. Not necessarily. Good people don't go to heaven. We'll say all kinds of hogwash to make ourselves feel, ourselves feel better about whether someone, where they spend eternity but we're so thankful that heaven is a default for everyone who is saved. Excuse me. People think heaven is a default for good people, but there is none good but God. Being good does not send you to heaven. Hell is a default for everyone, even if they're doing the best they can. Matthew 7 says this. Matthew 7 is 13 says, Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. I'm, 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 I'm landing this plane because we're finishing the book of Revelations today. The road to hell is broad and easy. Being a Christian is not easy, but it is worth it. And one day, Mr. Jeremy, if you'll go back to that slide with the children and the families in the artist rendition of heaven. It's a picture of people hugging. All the children that have been lost, all the loved ones. For every parent to hear mama or daddy. All those children that have been lost to miscarriage or abortion. I don't understand how it's going to work. But I don't believe God sends babies to hell. I, I'm not a theologian, but they have not had an age of accountability. I don't believe babies who die go to hell. Our loved ones that we know are on the other side. For Christians, death is not goodbye. For Christians, death is I'll see you later. Heaven and hell are real, and there's no in-between place for good people. 
you're going to wake up in heaven or you're going to wake up in hell. And the book of Revelation is very clear about what's going to happen. I want to see those that have gone on before me that I know are in heaven. I want to see my loved ones. I want to see, I, of course I want to see Jesus, but I, I want to have a good time. I want to, I want to enjoy everything that heaven has to offer. I want to see and talk to some people and not have to worry about, well, it's about time for us to get on. It's time for us. To... No, we have all eternity with no sickness, no pain, no how I got to go home and eat. I got to go home and take my medicine. Please don't miss heaven. And please make sure your soul is right. If you know the words to this chorus, let's sing it together. What a day that will be. What a day that will be When my Jesus I shall see When I look upon His face The one who saved me by His grace When He takes me by the hand And leads me through the promised land what a day, glorious day that will be. Bow your heads with me. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior and you'd like to receive Christ before we go, I want to meet you at the front here and pray a prayer of salvation with you. Is there anyone here who'd like to pray before we go today? Then, Lord, I thank you for your word that's sharper than a two-edged sword. I praise you and thank you, God, that I can make heaven my home, not because of anything I've done to deserve it, and I'm not good enough, but because I serve Christ, submit to him, and believe him to be my Savior and my Lord. Lord, help me to grow in the knowledge and the grace of Christ, and bring me back to the next appointed time for the glory, honor, and praise of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Shake hands with two or three people. Ladies, be here at 6 p.m. tonight.